Welcome back to Block TV. This is Links in the Chain. Now, today we are joined by Kim Grauer, Senior Economist at Chain Analysis, on their recently published 2020 State of Crypto Crime Report. Kim, thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, well, let's start off with the good news. The good news is that to start off the report, it mentions that 18% of all Americans and 35% of American millennials have purchased cryptocurrency in the last year. That's always good. The bad news, illicit cryptocurrency transactions have risen, both in total value and as a share of overall crypto activity. Uh, but, you know, in the big scheme of things, illicit transactions still make up a small share of all activity with the report finding just 1.1%. Kim, what kind of crimes are really driving these numbers and what direction are we heading in? The, well, actually, it was the biggest year in terms of the absolute amount of cryptocurrency crime that we've seen yet. There was, I think, a 180% increase from 2018 to 2019 in terms of the absolute amount being sent to and from illicit entities or illicit services, you know, whether it be a darknet marketplace, a sanctioned entity or a scammed address. That all went up both, as you mentioned before, an absolute amount and the share of overall activity. But when you break out the numbers, which is what we did, we saw that far and away, the biggest contributor to that increase was the growth of scams, notably just a few Ponzi schemes. I've actually talked with you before about what happened with Plus Token, a multi-billion dollar scam, and there was a few others that contributed to that amount. And so the trend, the increase that we saw was really driven by this, this specific type of scam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do remember last time we were speaking about a plus token and the offloading of their stolen Bitcoin that was kind of driving the price down a Bitcoin. Is that still happening? Is that is that pipe downward price pressure coming from the plus token sale off still a factor? We've been following some of the Ether funds and I haven't noticed I haven't tracked much of what's going on lately. So I don't even I don't know exactly what's happening with those funds right now, but there are certainly still funds that are in possession of the plus token scammers and even other scams, which do need to get cashed out still. Mm -hmm. Now, the majority of the scams, those big, those one tokens, the plus tokens, the one coins, sorry, the plus tokens, those seem to less be affecting, you know, U.S. investors. Are, are scams a big issue for U.S. based customers or, they, or do they mostly these scammers focus outside of the U.S.? Well, actually, a lot of the scams that we've looked at are more Asia based. Um, but and so that's a, that's um, a region where we've been really kind of trying to drive awareness. But when you're an exchange operating in a space where there's a lot of scamming happening, it doesn't really matter where you are. You have to educate your your customers about the possibility of there being a, a, a scam that is going to scam a, a ton of your customers. One of the things that's interesting about Plus Token is that for a really long time, it looked like a legitimate investment opportunity for people. It's only after you know the people are arrested and the, the truth comes out that you realize that there was a scam. So that could really impact anyone, regardless of geography. Mm -hmm. Now, I, what, what, what could uh, you know, one do? What could governments and regulators do to protect uh, their citizens uh, against these scams? Is it merely education? Is this like, uh, you know, like the early days of the Internet or or the early days, you know, when people would just click on any kind of spam on the side and get them? Or will this get better with time as people just become more acclimated and more in touch with cryptocurrencies? I think that one of the reasons why um, Ponzi's were so big last year was what we're hypothesizing is that we're in this unique time period where you know, maybe in 2017 or 2018, a lot of the people scammed might have been more crypto insiders, people investing in ICOs, which then turned out to be, um, you know, exit scams. But now we're at this unique time where we're seeing that they're actually um, more vulnerable people are probably falling victim to these Ponzi schemes. And that's because we're there's still this hope to get rich quick that, or people kind of still associate that with cryptocurrencies, but also there's more mass adoption. So there's this, it, this has brought in this new type of victim. And that's why we saw specifically the Ponzi scheme as such a prominent scam in last year. In terms of 
how to get around that. That's one of the reasons why we do this research. It's about education and informing people that you should, you know, be aware that there are still scammers out there and that, you know, you should be careful with how you spend your money. But also there are steps that exchanges can take. For example, should they be uh, not only educating people, but actually stepping in and maybe freezing funds that are going to known scam accounts. Now that's like a whole nother kind of issue to take on, but it's um, something that is, uh, it's a tool that can be used to prevent more and more people from getting victimized by these Ponzi schemes. Mm -hmm. That's definitely an available tool, but uh, they politically charged in the crypto sphere, at least politically charged. Uh, there are definitely two, uh, very um, powerful opinions on that within the crypto sphere. Now, uh, scams are definitely happening and they're a big deal. Uh, but ransomwares also took a massive jump in, over this past year. Uh, what's the latest with ransomwares? Ransomware is definitely something we get asked about the most. And it's, it's a really scary thing because anyone can be, become the victim of a ransomware attack. We profiled this new type of ransomware attack that's called a ransomware service. And we, so what we saw in the report was this growth in ransomware as a service, which is targeting smaller businesses and organizations that are, you know, a new type of, um, you know, victim for these new ransomware attacks. And we also saw that um, because of that increase in the ransomware service, blockchain analytics kind of allows you to have a better sense of the vendors. So we, in the port report, we outline or an investigation into Soda Bokini, which was a ransomware attack, which you, probably, you may have heard about this year. And we can see the kind of splitting of payments into going off to vendors and the perpetrators. But we also saw that a lot of the victims were in North America this year by looking at where the funds were coming from. Um, so, yeah. Well, it's really interesting. I, I've seen reports that, that, that have it at up to 50% of U.S.-based organizations have been attacked by some sort of ransomware uh, over this past year in 2019. So clearly a very widespread issue. Now, it seems like finally governments are waking up to it. Uh, Maryland, who, you know, whose city of Baltimore famously, they got a massive ransomware attack. They lost about $18 million, and it's probably bigger than this at this point. Uh, they introduced a bill against making it illegal to even possess ransomware. Uh, and on the flip side, New York actually is trying to get a bill passed that makes it uh, illegal to use taxpayer money to pay um, the mm -hmm. ransoms for the ransomware. Uh, are, are these steps effective? Uh, and if so, what would you suggest? One of the one of the first and foremost, one of the things we always say about ransomware is there's is to you know when you've been attacked, don't don't you should report the address because one of the one of our findings was that you see these waves of strain attacks that are happening for three months or six months, and so we need we're in a place where we need to be gathering as much information as possible so submit your ransomware addresses we want to destigmatize being attacked by ransomware and so there was a recent report where people are even afraid to report publicly that they've been attacked because there it might impact their share price so we need to better equip ourselves to react to ransomware by collecting these addresses which is one of the reasons why we recently launched a a sheet where people can tell us about their, their, if they've been attacked and submit their address, all the information that they know, maybe even a screenshot of what the um, ransom note letter looked like. So there are things that we can do to help um, prevent against more attacks, mostly in the address collections phase. And um, I, when it comes to how to handle if you have been attacked, I think that you should defer to the recommendations of law enforcement probably. Mm -hmm. Well, so far, it, it does seem like uh, the recommendations across most law enforcement is not to pay the, uh, the ransom, the attackers, that just incentivizes them to attack again. Now, that is tough for a lot of these smaller districts, a lot of these smaller municipalities that, you know, it might be better for the whole, but it is kind of tough once their systems get taken yeah. down. Um, now, let's take a shift over a little bit uh, to terrorist financing, which has, you know, that always gets the headline, uh, it yeah. pops up every couple of months you know, terrorist head headline uh, financing using cryptocurrencies. What's happening with that in the crypto sphere? One of the, one of the things that we're actually 
really been talking about lately. We did, we talked about it on Twitter recently, but it also features in our report is um, not so much speaking to the trends in terrorist financing, which are really, really hard to speak to like in absolute terms, but the fact, the role of misinformation in terrorist financing and how they're, what we talked about in the report, for example, is a payment to one of a, a merchant service provider, which was mistakenly attributed to a terrorist, uh, a known terrorist organization, but in fact, it was an internal transfer. So that caught, that then made a lot of headlines got picked up in the media. And then we look at it in our system and we can see right away that this is actually not what's happening. There's a technical confusion around what an internal payment versus an actual economic payment. And, but in terms, so that's one thing that we've been really trying to educate people about, but also in terms of trends, we compared to, uh, you know, public campaigns in um, 2019 and 2018. And we found that there, there was actually slightly more sophisticated tools that were used. Um, and they raised more funds in a shorter period of time and used a little bit more advanced wallet softwares. So there was actually increased sophistication in the campaigns that we did analyze in addition to the fact that you need to kind of have really advanced blockchain analytics to be able to see what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. But you know, as well, you know, the, the, the criminals always take a step forward and then regulators and governments try to keep up with them. You know, th this past mm -hmm. year did see uh, harsher uh, AML and KYC regulations across the board. Uh, Europe, you know, kind of launched a five AMLD. Um, you know, are, are these things having an effect on, on the money laundering and on the terrorist financing? Is this working? Yeah, it's a really important question. And we think that the pressure that these new regulations have been placing on exchanges has been instrumental for them improving and upgrading their KYC programs. And it's you know one of the main reasons why we've seen so much growth in, in compliance in this in this industry. Mm -hmm. Now, I, the last time we spoke, you know, you, you your report highlighted uh, that one of the ways that these money launderers and you know these scammers are able to actually get around KYC and AML requirements is by going through OTC agents. Is that still a factor? Is that still a kind of loophole that these people are using to money, launder their money? Oh yeah, it's been it's been actually a, a really recent finding of ours, and this OTC network is you know still in action. We we just started really um, t talking about this publicly only recently, and our findings have been focusing on how is it where are all these illicit funds going to, and then asking a lot of you know research questions to drill down into the data, and then we ultimately found that you know, OTC brokers that we've encountered in past investigations have been really instrumental in, in 2019 in moving those funds. Mm -hmm. Well, Kim, you know, as we see, the cryptosphere and the crypto community and blockchain as a whole keeps on growing and it only becomes bigger and bigger of a target for these schemers and notorious players. Now, while illicit activity, uh, according to your reports, is a very small, small fraction of all the crypto-related transactions. It still holds a very important, important place. So we do uh, thank you for the important role you are playing in educating, tracking, analyzing, and protecting uh, the users in the sphere. We look forward to having you on in the future to help us break down all the latest crime trends. Thank you so much for joining us. And for all our viewers at home, if you want more on cryptocurrencies, technology, and blockchain, make sure to check us out at blockchain.com. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.